Okay, I have with me today Mr. Donald O'Neill, fellow Irishman and documentary filmmaker. And you've just released Serial Killers 2, Run on Fat. And what I want to talk about first is Serial Killers 1, because watching that, I think that was about more establishing the healthfulness of a high-fat, low-carb diet. So if you could just sort of give us a brief summary of what that experiment was, what did you do, and what were the results of that experiment? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Serial Killers 1, as, as you well know, but many don't, was a, a personal journey to try and hack my genes and avoid some of the illnesses that have sort of struck down the older men in my family, my dad and my uncle. Um, we're all athletes in the family, so these were uh, elite Gaelic footballers, and they hadn't really put on any weight or... or abused themselves. My father never drank his whole life, never smoked, anything like that. So when he had a heart attack, we were shocked to say the least. And I sort of went down the, the rabbit hole to try and understand a bit more, or a lot more rather, about heart disease and metabolic disorders. And what I found sort of surprised me and then shocked me and uh, ultimately led to the to the the making of what would become serial killers and the message behind that movie was uh, probably missed by a lot of people because people tend to focus on the weight but um mm -hmm. you know we included uh my exercise regime in that for very specific reasons because we did not want people to think that you, you can exercise yourself out of a bad diet you can still be lean and you can still be metabolically unhealthy and there are a lot of guys out there you know who get to to middle age and beyond and, and they're they've been smashing carbs and, and sports drinks and goos for a long long time and mm -hmm. th there's no doubt in my mind and, and the research seems to support it that they're damaging themselves and it may not appear on the outside but on the inside there's there's trouble brewing and 40 percent of, of lean people will go on to develop some type of metabolic disorder so it ain't, a, it ain't a, you know, a, a prescription for lifelong health just because you're lean. There's more going on under the bonnet. Absolutely. So, and so at the end of this, it was 30 days. You're on a high fat, low carb diet, and you end up, you lose body fat for a start, and you increase your lean mass. But as you say, all your health markers actually improved, including your cholesterol rate. Yeah, the, the health markers improved, and. After that, that was let's say 28 days, and I was I was getting up to close to 4,000 calories a day. I was exercising eight minutes a week um, on a on a hit sort of Tabata protocol, which your viewers would be familiar with. And um, yeah, it, it was 70% fat, and very very similar to uh, some of the diets you'll see, uh, you know, the bodybuilders and the aesthetic athletes engaging in for mm -hmm. periods of time. But for the general public, that was a, a wow moment. Um, but I think we discussed before, one of the best books, certainly that I've read, was The Anabolic Diet. And yeah. it kind of mirror, mirrored that approach. So I, I did that for 28 days without cycling any carbohydrates. Right. Um, yes, you didn't carb up. Inter yeah, I did not carb up. Um, I had to carb up a little bit afterwards because I, I was... Uh, <laughs> the camera doesn't really tell at all. It puts a bit of weight on you. But although... Um, Physically, in my days as a as a high jumper, I, I would have kept going because I felt magnificent. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're when you're a bit older and you you lose the weight in the face like I did, you don't look the best. And the girlfriend, like my wife, was uh, insistent that I put on a bit of weight. So put some back on. We carved up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we we, we had those bloods uh, tested by one of the top pathologists in the world called Dr. Ken Sakaris, who's based out of Melbourne. Uh, and that's on the extras page at serialkillersmovie.com. But he was really interesting because he dug down even deeper than we had done in the movie. And he gives you a very, very clear perspective on what numbers you really need to to get yeah. tested to know exactly where you where you lie. And triglycerides for him were the big number. And he said all that particle size was a waste of time because you're all right. met metabolically, you're in superb condition. And the other thing... He got into the inflammatory markers in much more detail because you, you can't spell out all that detail to a general audience. But he he was he was surprised. He said for he said you know you're you're okay you're you're lean but you're you're fairly well muscled and and you're, and you're fit. He said normally we see breakdown.
from the training process, he said, there's, there's no sign of anything anywhere in your body. So you, you're not under putting yourself under any stress. There, there, there's just zero inflammation across all those stats. So he was, he was um, very impressed, which was great to hear. Um, it's funny that you were saying about the anabolic diet, because that was my way into this as well. That was mm-hmm. I found that online, and then I, I bought it. I think I have it here, so actually, somewhere. The anabolic by Mauro Di Pasquale. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, I brought. I went to. Uh, I went on holiday a few years ago, Bulgaria. Year or years ago, God, that might be near ten years ago. And I brought that book with me and I read it, and I came home and I, was, I changed everything. <laughs> you know, well, as soon as I read that book, here, the anabolic solution. That yeah. Mauro Di Pasquale. Anyway, so moving on, serial killers too. So you, you've established the healthfulness of eating high fat, low carb. Now, in the movie Serial Killers 2, it's called Run on Fat. You're saying since the 70s, sports scientists recommended carbing up for endurance athletes. Your whole point is that that's actually an inefficient way to go about, about it because they would be better fueled by fat. Is that the point? That is the point. Uh, I, I think the there's still so much we don't know in all of this, but there, there's no doubt in my mind uh, after meeting, you know, the, the Steve Finneys, the Noakes, the, you know, Sammy Inkling, the athlete we follow, and looking very, very closely at what they do, that um, you know, when Tim Noakes says no athlete anywhere should be consuming more than 200 grams a day of carbs, mm-hmm. I, I, I believe it because the... And there's, the scientists will say it's still all anecdotal. Well, you know, Bruce Fordyce, the, probably the greatest ultra runner that's ever lived. I mean, as he says in the movie, the, I mean, the anecdotes are becoming a statistic. There's, there are just yeah, uh, so many. Really, 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 really powerful results happening. And the one thing that the sports scientists have yet to do, um, it's, it's fascinating to me that it hasn't happened, but... They point to uh, you know ten or twelve studies where the fat adapted athletes and you know the the performance died and you know it, it didn't work and this is this is nonsense. But what what they're missing is that um, as you well know, if you put somebody on on your plan, it's it's not a two week plan. I mean you, you don't intervene on a dietary basis for two weeks and expect to get a result. So they've been they've been testing and, and the few trials that they've done, they've been testing a small number of athletes during an adaptation period. When they haven't come out the other side, so of course they're 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 nowhere. And the study, one of the the really nice studies that I like is of uh, elite gymnasts because I was a an international high jumper, and on day eight of serial killers, I felt what could only be described as a some type of anabolic boot up the arse. I just felt amazing, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I I broke a, a record for for a really aggressive. Uh, test set that I do, it's like a burpee into a, a full chin up and I got to about 50 in the, in the four minute Tabata right. time scale which was um, you know, a good 10% better than I'd ever done and you just don't expect that so I knew right there and then there was something performance based in this and Noakes had ripped out his carb loading chapter from the lower of yeah. running as well so I, I nearly wanted to fast forward right then to get into the in amongst the athletes but we couldn't find any and um, we we knew that they had to be doing it, but they're kind of keeping it on the on the low down. So uh-huh. you know, th- there's a few steps need to be taken. The, the scientists they need to establish what w- w- how do you define a low carbohydrate, high fat diet for scientific testing purposes? What what's the benchmark? Is it seventy twenty ten or what is it? Because you'll see them pushing out you know one hundred and fifty grams a day as low carb, but I, know. That, I mean I know. Uh, and they, then they just they won't engage because they know they haven't done this and uh-huh. you know as Noakes points out 95% plus of research in this space is financed by carb interest so you know their their salaries and their livelihoods depend on um, on finance from these companies to, to fund yeah. the research and you know Noakes has, has uh, he, he continues he, he's recently retired but he's now firing on all cylinders in this whole area and and he's just in, you know, a major screening in Durban. We had uh, John Smith, the Rugby World Cup winning captain on the panel with us, and we had world-class athletes galore. I mean, you, you throw a dart in South Africa and you find one. 
<laughs> but um, you know, these, these guys are on it, and I met the the Olympic team doctor and the spring box doctor, and they're looking at this uh, approach, you know, to give them that one percent, you know, and that's what at the very very top level they're after. And I, I think the the bodybuilders and the aesthetic athletes they got there first because that's what they were after, and athletes will feel it before the scientists test it. That's just how it is. Yeah, and at that point about pushing out these studies that are absolutely unrepresentative of what this uh, uh, high fat low carb diet is all about, it's just really annoying, and they do it all the time. Yeah. And the, you know, the headline will be, you know, basically, you know, low low carb diets suck, and then you look at the thing, and it's, it's not a low carb diet at all. Yeah. Or the people weren't fat adapted. You know, the, the seven days or something. It's like, come on. Yeah. The people weren't even adapted to fat, and the point that. Um, in the movie, your movie, what you're saying is, once you get fat adapted, once your body, you remove the, okay, if you eat carbs, you burn carbs, you remove the carbs from the diet, eat more fat, your body's then put in a position to burn fat as its primary source of fuel. But, and it takes some time for that to switch over, seven days, maybe two weeks. If that, once that happens, you're saying that your performance will actually improve. Yes, certainly um, for, Endurance performance, anything sort of two hours and beyond, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's 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 just a given. So where this is gripped first, uh, you had the the bodybuilders 25, 30 years ago, but now you've got the ultra runners and you know the guys who are running 12, 24 hours, the, the Zach Betters, the Timmy Olsons, uh, they're not bonking. They effectively become yep. bonk proof. So, um, and there's a study coming out by Jeff Volek. And you know, to put this whole issue in perspective, in its political perspective, let's say, Steve Finney did his first study in 1984 when, when this emerged, and it was with obese people on a bike. He had them on an Atkins or a, you know, a keto-type diet, and uh, their endurance increased. So he thought it was an, an error. So he did it again and found the same thing again. It wasn't what he was looking for. And you know, it's, it's 30 years later before somebody has, has been given the adequate resources to continue that work. And Jeff Folick's faster study is due out um, this year. And right. he took, uh, it's, it's a study into ultra athletes and they put them on the treadmill for three hours. They're pulling, you know, muscle biopsies and all sorts. And you've got a guy like um, Zach Bitter, um, the 12 hour US record holder. And Zach is able to run to, just over 75% of his VO2 max with zero requirement for carbs. So there, he, he's, he's three times as efficient, if you like, as a, as a regular athlete. And yep. what, what it means for him, for the steady state athletes, which they can replicate in the lab, he can just keep going at a seven minute mile pace for whatever. If, if he kicks into a sprint or, or whatever, clearly you're into uh, the, the glycogen zone. And there are tricks and tools to address that. But it seems to me that you've got the likes of Aussie Roots footballers who have gone public now. We couldn't, we couldn't get them on camera when we were filming. It was okay. just too early. But they, in terms of uh, you know, power, speed, strength, they're the finest field sport athletes in the world for my money. I've spent time with one of the pro teams down there and watched them train. And they're magnificent specimens. Uh, they have two, two professional teams um, on this kind of diet at the moment, um, and they're seeing great results. So you can't replicate a field sport in the gym, right. but because I mean the, the, the physical hit those guys are taking and the, the power output is massive. So it's there's massive intermittent explosiveness combined with endurance. They're hitting up to 15, 20 kilometers a game, uh-huh. and their performance is improving. So that kind of disproves the theory that oh you can't do explosive power based work on this and you know they're, they're supplement with a little bit of carbs but their, their carb intake is probably 20 25 percent where it was right and um the one criticism i think people would people who are pro carbing up and or, or just pro high carb all the time they're going to say okay you can switch the fat and you'll have a slow burning longer lasting fuel but then what about um what about when you need quick energy is that is that where ketones come in? Is that, does that help? Yeah, great, great question. And I've got to tell you, it's uh, one of the most fascinating areas of, of research that I've stumbled into yet since I started this whole serial killer's adventure because um, 
your folks need to look up a guy called Professor Dominic D'Agostino out of Florida. And Dom is being financed by the US military and has been for about nine years now. So the, the ketones are offering some remarkable performance benefits. And to, to one study that puts it in perspective was, uh, was conducted in Oxford University where they put 16 of the GB rowing team on um, a ketone ester. So they weren't fat adapted or anything like that. They just popped right. a, a ketone ester. Within an, I think it was within an hour. One of them broke a world record. Six of them <laughs> got a season's best and 10 of them got a personal best or vice versa. But everybody excelled and they were like, whoa. So there's an underground war going on at the moment to control that space. Some of these esters have been patented. Um, uh, I, I spoke with a phenomenal businessman in the US yesterday who is in the process of creating, um, let's say, an exogenous ketone type supplement, which is, um, which is derived from a natural, natural foods. So th there's remarkable stuff going on. And what that will mean, it will kind of dismantle the, the debate because ketogenic diets are, I mean, it can be tough for, for people to stick to. But um, if you can get your hands on a product that will shunt the ketones to the front of the queue, and yes. they're, they're getting ketone levels up over, up over one um, with this in, in their trial so far, you're in a situation where you, you could essentially have the best of both worlds. And where this is coming into play is not just in athletic performance, but it's also in military performance for cognitive function. When the, when the Navy SEALs deep dive, they've been getting um, epileptic type seizures. They discovered that ketones are protective in that environment. Yeah, they're working yeah. on and NASA are involved. You know, their research and sending man to Mars. You know, they discovered that ketones have, offer a protective element against radiation. So it's like uh -huh. all of a sudden ketones are, are becoming this this gold dust. But you know, your folks are going to be some of the first on top of this. But it's coming and it's coming pretty fast. And the other people who will benefit um, are cancer sufferers because the military research has tipped over. They, they inadvertently found that a ketogenic diet in conjunction with branched chain amino acids, which, which your folks will be intimately familiar with, mm -hmm. is an even better combination than just a ketogenic diet. They've discovered that um, in some cancer patients, particularly with solid mass tumors, the they're able to um, starve the cancer cells of, uh, of glucose and they can't mm -hmm. switch to, to uh, a ketone metabolism. And they're, they're strengthening the healthy cells, weakening the cancer cells, and then you come in with a, with a hit of radiation or chemo and they've had some tremendous results with that, of course, anecdotal at this point. But, you know, what, what I always say is, you know, health and wellness and performance is a bit like politics. All you give a shit about is yourself. You know, yeah. so you know, t tell the cancer sufferer who's who's come through, and and Dom is in communication with about a thousand cancer patients. Um, they don't give a damn if they're an anecdote, and nor does a yeah. you know an aesthetic athlete or a, an Olympian or a South African rugby player. They don't give a shit. Well, so they're going to be they're going to be ahead of the game. Right, and when you, when you say uh, that the combination of ketones and BCAAs, branching the amino acids, do you mean a BCAA supplement, or do you mean People eating protein from the from the diet, or do you mean they actually t take a supplement? supplement? Right. Supplement. Yeah, I, the, the full details have not been released, uh, but it, it, it's it's just a remarkable. I've had a glimpse at what they're at what they're looking at, and we're now researching our next project, and this is all part of it. But um, you know, it, it goes back to in 1931. There was a, a German scientist called Otto Warburg who won the Nobel Prize for his work on cell metabolism. And that led to the Warburg theory, and, and uh, that, that's where the, a lot of this research uh, harks back to. But it's a remarkable story, but um, mm -hmm. it's one that, that kind of went, went by the wayside. And the, uh, you know, it's almost 100 years later, but the Germans pre-war had all of this research down pat, and it got shoved off the table because it was German and they lost the war, I guess. And then America stepped in and rewrote nutritional history right. but in the early 1900s the Germans were all over this stuff and they had some remarkable research and, and, and science to back it up. Crazy and like 2015 yeah. and you know yeah. that's so crazy isn't it? Um, yeah. 
Uh, one of the things that, uh, well, serial, serial killers too that you said about was the the biomarkers of inflammation reduced. Now, would that is that going to have a positive impact um, impact on people's recovery from exercise? Yeah, nail on the head, Mark. I mean, absolutely. And the, the guys who are, who are really really benefiting from this are the older athletes. I got invited out to the the LA Lakers training ground in the US, which was a uh, yeah, an absolute seen, treat. It was yeah. brilliant. Um, so you know, Tim DeFrancesco is doing great work there, and same thing. He's saying, you know, listen, of course it's anecdotal, but Kobe's on it. You know, Nash is on it. Yeah. I walked. I walked in through the door, which was ten foot tall, by the way, and everything. <laughs> it's like Gulliver's Travels in there, and they had a board up, a whiteboard with all the the body fat percentiles of of the Lakers, and he was just pointing out who was you know super compliant and, and who wasn't. But what they're doing there is trying to get the athletes to to eat real food everywhere they go. The you know the, the message is reasserted. So while they're while they're in the training facility, um, they're always being reminded and they're always being tipped to ask themselves, you know, am I going for the sugar free option or mm-hmm. and their fridge is layered. You know, the top is water and then it, as you go down each level, there's more sugar and you've right. got the the Gatorades and the juices at the bottom. So if you're seven foot tall, they want you down your knees <laughs> to go for that Gatorade. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the way. Um, yeah. I mean, do you think ever see this going mainstream? Do you think it's possible that it's, this is, can ever be accepted by you know, the medical world ever accepting this as a healthy way to go? You know, I, I think uh, it's it's a good question. I think it might come from unexpected sources. You know, Sammy Inkinen, who we follow in running fat, is a is a world Ironman champion. He's a phenomenal athlete. Uh, I think, and then you hear, you know, Kobe Bryant's on it, and you know, the some of the Lakers, and then what? One of the the, the the most famous soccer teams in the world has their entire squad on this protocol at the moment. I can't say who it is, <sighs> but it's hap- it's happening, and you know, that that just gives me chills down my spine because you know, I, general general health is great, but you know, when you get into performance and athletes, that's just where I love to be. So that that excites excites the hell out of me. Um, so you've got that. And then the other area where I think it, it has a real shot is, is in cancer treatment because the, the DNA approach to cancer has not worked. This human genome project that you could, you could say it went back to Nixon declaring war on cancer in 1971. Clinton picked up the mantle in about 10 years ago. Then they completed the project and it's just confused the life out of them. Some cancer research is now reverting back to Otto Warburg's pathways from the 1930s. Um, I think heart disease and diabetes are just not frightening enough for people. Um, I think cancer scares the shit out of everyone. Uh, I think uh, you know, a message coming from a cancer research background with you know, the support of world-class athletes who happen to be eating the same way to excel on them on the pitch or wherever it is they're performing, that then becomes a stronger combination. But it won't break through just because it's the right thing to, thing to do because there's just billions and billions of dollars and there's dogma, decades of dogma standing against it. And yep. in Ireland, as you know, I mean, I've yet to find a medic that will support serial killers. And yet here I am in Cape Town. I'm with, you know, I've just spent the week with a World Cup winning rugby captain, you know, the... Olympians in Durban, their team doctor, the Springboks doctor, the Sharks, one of the top rugby teams in the world, they hosted the screening. We've got Tim Noakes here tonight. In Australia, Dr. Peter Bruckner, who's with the Australian cricket team, was the doctor to Liverpool. You know, he's, he, he's the author of one of the most important sports medicine books out there, clinical sports medicine. You know, he's all over this. He's fully supportive. You go to the States in there with the LA Lakers. You know, the, but yet in Ireland, nothing has happened. Yeah. Andy Moore is the first athlete, the Mayo Gaelic footballer we feature, that has tipped into this. And he, he's, he's a fantastic advocate for it, but not much happening. We'd be 90% overweight and obese by 2030. The, the Irish Ireland. in Ireland? Yeah, wow. yeah. we're about to, we're, we're sort of neck and neck with the UK and Malta, but we're about to blow them all out of the water. So you're going to be a busy boy. 
<laughs> plenty of clans anyway. Um, you said about that football team, the soccer team. Can you say, is it an English team or what country? Can you say what country they're from? It's Just a European image. team. It's a European team. Um, but you know th- that that's where this stuff comes out. But they don't want yeah. it coming out because they're seeing benefits and they don't want to give it up yet. They want yeah. You know? They don't want the competition yeah. to know about him, right? Yeah. You know, uh, Bodie Miller that we show in the movie briefly. 36 years of age, the oldest ever Alpine Olympian medalist. He dropped 18 pounds, I think it was, coming into the games. The coaches were going crazy. He was like, Ugh. but what happens? And Noakes points this out, Tim Noakes. And, you know, is, is there a greater sports scientist alive today? I, I'm not aware of it, but um, and when, it, when he makes statements like this, it's based on 45 years in the field. But what he's saying is we, we look at performance um, acutely. And we now need to look at an athlete through the spectrum of their career. So if you have somebody who's healthier day to day, they're going to get to the starting line or onto the pitch and they're going to be in a healthier state. And there's a benefit to that. The recovery impact of lowered inflammatory markers is amazing. There's no question. And and the older guys are feeling this. And you, you just have a generally healthier organism. So... Okay, because elite performance isn't particularly a healthy thing to be doing. I mean, we all know that. I'm sitting here with three discs out of my back. So it's, it's not great, but um, it appears to be elongating careers. And it certainly appears to be offering benefits beyond the field of play, way beyond the field of play, that nonetheless transfer to a better performing athlete. And that's what it comes down to. And I'm screaming at the sports scientist saying, you know, are you a running scientist? Because they'll say, well, this study of runners shows this. And I'm like, well, yeah, you adapted them for two weeks. What do you expect? Or they're on a yeah. bike. I'm like, you know, two pro AFL teams. What do you say? Anecdotes. What? These, these are highly paid athletes. So you think yeah. a business is going to put their ass on the line yeah. with based on anecdotal information? Yeah. And they, they, they just they, they, they continue to, to brush it off. But I mentioned the gymnastics study. And this will interest your people because they adapted them for a month and sure they, they got the dip. But when they came back at the end of a month, they had um, improved body composition. These are like Olympic quality gymnastics or gymnasts. So they're already seriously cut. But they, mm-hmm. they you know, they, they, they took, a, let's say, a percentile of body weight off them and, um, and that would have been in, in body fat. But their strength to power ratio has improved even marginally. So for someone who's a like a jumper, a gymnast, or you know a fighter, like anybody who can up that power to weight ratio, and Jeff Foley himself was a competitive bodylifter, you're onto a winner. I mean, you know, there's, some, there's something there for everyone. Um, so it's it's a fascinating space with with much more to come, I think. And you were saying there about their their body composition improved, and yours actually improved on the first movie. Which is very yeah. relevant to my audience because the, the, the whole belief in bodybuilding is that it's impossible to lose body fat and build muscle at the same time. I've been saying for years, it's not impossible. It can't, the, the human body can do this. If you, if you put it, your body in a position where it burns fat as, for its primary source of fuel, if you can train properly and you can give your body the protein it needs, it can do both at the same time. And you experienced this, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, anybody who looks at run on fat, they'll see Sammy Enkinen. Sammy rolls up to triathlon regularly, he tells me, and people ask him, can, can I help you? Because he's built like a sprinter. So no one yeah. actually believes he's a triathlete. And we had somebody at a screening here who raced against him at the, the Wildflower, which is the biggest amateur triathlon event in the world, which he won a couple of times. But he saw him, and he was like, what is this guy doing here? Look at the size of him. <laughs> and, you know, next thing all he saw was the back of Sammy's ass. And he, he just said he, he couldn't <laughs> believe it. He couldn't believe it because... Uh, uh, he, he, Sammy is an incredible power athlete as well, mm-hmm. and that's um, he's telling me that his body just continues to improve, and he's 38, 39 now, you know. So it, it's uh, and he's not even a professional athlete. He, he he competes and races at a professional level, but he he trains 10, 12 hours a week, which would be approximately half of what an Ironman training to his standard would do at a minimum. So he trains with intensity. And he trains with purpose. And, you know, he is now at a stage where power-based training is, presents no difficulty for him. And he's, he's fully keto-adapted. His, 
his ketone reading a couple of weeks back, he'd get up in the morning, was 4.8. He said his, his brain was almost buzzing. And, you know, 0.5 is the level you want to kind of get over before you start to see some benefits. So he's, yeah. he, he's cooking ketones. And uh, when they get off the boat, we, we obviously followed them from rowing from California to Hawaii, 45 days, the equivalent of running two marathons a day back to back. They put in a sprint at the end mark. No other team in the race, even the four-man teams, um, got within 10 kilometers of them on that day. So they covered, I think, 80 kilometers in one day. And the four-man teams, and it was Sammy and his wife. This wasn't even like two big blokes. So um, yeah. their performance was remarkable. And what was even more remarkable was the fact that there was zero breakdown in the body when they, when they did the, the test at the end of all that. They'd abused the hell out of their bodies. Um, their, you know, their their genes were still singing, and their, as were their muscles and the cells and everything. Everything was happy in the camp. So that that even surprised Steve Finney. So that, that I think uh, in the in the the movie after this that forty five days is done, there you say that normally if there had been just carb athletes, there would have been some breakdown. But the him and I believe it's his wife it was nothing, and she's it's important to say she's also fat adapted as well, right? Yeah, they, yeah. Bo- they both are, yeah. yeah. And she doesn't eat red meat, interestingly. So her, her protein source was, was salmon. So she was almost a, like a, yeah. let's say, a, a vegan with salmon type approach. But she right. did not, her weight did not budge by yes. one yeah. pound. Yes. And you know, she's not a big lady. But, and the week before they did that, she flew back from winning um, the International Marathon in Everest. So, you know... Alfred Sheet, I mean, they're just, they're two remarkable athletes, but um, yeah, the the enzymes that they looked at, you know, Philly was just, wow. I mean, it was like, just, because, I mean, it was a remarkable undertaking, and to then have the ability, excuse me, to, to study them in great detail was a joy for him, so it was it was really cool being, being there when that all happened. Sure. Um, one final point that totally shocked me by the way uh you actually in a former previous life <laughs> brought out a sports drink a sugar drink onto the irish market is that right that's right yeah oh my god so yeah. this is back at like how long ago was this and were you fully this is when you were totally taken in by the idea of you need sugar when, yeah. when did this happen when was this it was about 12 years ago mark so i started the uh, the Players Union for Gaelic Games, which for your American viewers is our national sports in Ireland. Uh-huh. And um, to raise money for that, I created a, a commercial program, licensing program. So it was a non-profit organization set up to help the players. And I had worked with, with IMG, the big sports marketing company that the movie Joey Maguire was made about. So I came back to Ireland in the late 90s, set up that organization, set up a commercial licensing program. Um, one of the, the biggest wins we had was uh, the launching of that isotonic sports drink. And it's probably it's probably the best commercial deal in terms of, you know, the intricacies of it that I've ever done in my business career. And it raised millions of euros for the players. Mm-hmm. But I walked in the door. My cousin was one of the top players at the time. And I walked in the door and his wife was a dentist and she nearly bit my head off. I, you know, that's, that's the stuff I had done myself. I thought sports drinks were, were a great idea, but uh, interestingly, the, the, the sports scientist, Dr. Liam Hennessy, who is responsible for bringing Irish rugby into the modern era, he said to us at the time, he said, yeah, you know, the, the story has proven that it works. He says, but you know what, guys? He said, if I'm honest, you're better off drinking a pint of milk. He says, sure. Really? I pointed to us. Yeah, yeah. He said, you know. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> It was, uh, I, I thought I was doing the right thing, and, and I wasn't, and then I, you know, I would give it to my, my nephew, my niece, and I was like, oh, I think back <laughs> now, and I'm just, I'm horrified, I'm absolutely oh, horrified, yeah. and it came okay. in ahead of Powerade, it was, it was a big deal. Oh, that was before Powerade? No, it came in over the top of Powerade, it, it was second to look at it in the market straight out the gate, with TV ads running with GA players, and it was a, it was a massive success. It's yeah. crazy. Um, okay, I don't know where can people go to see Serial Killers 2? Runonfatsmovie.com and there's a, a bit of an intricacy because they introduced new VAT legislation in the EU which utterly screwed us so we didn't think we'd be able to get it released in the UK at all 
Um, but our distribution partner out of San Francisco, Gumroad, has a solution. So if you're in the EU, you can only watch it through one channel, and that's that's on the website as well. So click the button. Okay. On your website, your personal website, where, where is that? I don't really have a personal website. We're very busy on Facebook, um, uh, forward slash Serial Killers Movie. We're on Twitter, Serial Killers 13. Um, that's kind of where we do most of our stuff. But the original you know, Serial Killers Movie, we've got .com. We've got a, a bit of a, a blog on there from the first movie. And we're blogging away on Run On Fat. And we're, but we're predominantly communicating via social media and trying to get out and reaching out to you know, the athletes and the interests out there who are looking at this. Okay, so folks, look up Serial Killers on Facebook and at Serial Killers 13 on, on Twitter. Twitter yeah. And if you're watching this on YouTube or iTunes or anywhere, go to musclehack.com forward slash podcast hyphen three. I'll have all the show notes there and I'll link, I'll link to your social media profiles, Donald, and also to the movie for people to check it out. So thank you very much, mate. It's been a pleasure. Mark, thanks a million.